This is Spectrum. Alternative Myths. Homeopathy. Secret Society. Hypnosis. The Paranormal. Alternative Energy. UFO. Abduction. The Weird. The Wild. And the Wonderful. With your hosts, Tom Theophanos and Scott Jordan. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Spectrum Radio Network on BBS Radio 2. I'm Scott Jordan, and remember, there's no such thing as too much information. Unless, of course, you have wisdom, in which case you don't need any more information. Adam Trombley is the director of Project Earth for the Institute for Advanced Studies at Aspen. He's proven to be one of the most influential and unorthodox scientists of his generation. In 1980, Adam and a colleague, Joseph Kahn, designed and applied for patents for the Closed Path Homopolar Generator, a potentially revolutionary design for super-efficient generation of electrical power. In June of 1982, international letters of patent were published by the International Patent Cooperation Treaty Organization. In 1983, Adam began to dedicate his efforts to Project Earth. The late R. Buckminster Fuller is quoted as saying, Project Earth is a human design experiment. It will be incumbent upon human beings throughout the Earth to become a living network, to demonstrate the power of working synergistically with all their environment to ensure a a future worth living in. In 1984, Adam was awarded the R.J. Reynolds III Endowment for his efforts with Project Earth. As the 80s progressed, copies of the Closed Path Homopolar Generator patent had circulated throughout the world. In 1986, one scientist, Parmahamsa Tiwari, who at the time was the head of the quality control for the Torpor Atomic Power Station in Trombay, India, Tiwari published results of the experiments carried out with a crude facsimile of the machine described in the patent. In the American Industrial Journal, Magnets, Tiwari wrote, The test results have shown an efficiency of the machine above 250%. It was the first time in human history that claims of greater than 100% output had been independently verified by a bona fide third party using a description of the art provided by the patent document. This further propelled Adam and Project Earth into the international spotlight. At the largest new energy technology conference ever held in Hanover, Germany in 1987, Parmahamsa Tawari had brought his rather crude facsimile of the Trombley Kahn generator The next day, Adam gave one of those lectures with an impact that never seems to leave you. Adam continued his research into the new energy technologies with a colleague, David Farnsworth. In June 1989, in New York City, Trombley and Farnsworth physically demonstrated a small solid-state electrical transformer that measurably showed an efficiency of 54 to 1. Adam then walked down the street to the United Nations and gave an address. As a result of that talk, it's hard to believe that the entire world didn't change as a result. The American people in particular have still not gotten the message that there's an entirely new and benign option to the current death spiral of humanity. As a result of ignoring the opportunity that was presented that day in 1989, the world still suffers under the tyranny of fossil fuels and global power structure, which seems bent on the eradication of the entire species. Today, Adam continues to pursue the work of Project Earth in spite of the fact that, in his view, the destabilization of planet Earth has reached critical, even nearly irreversible proportions. Hello, Adam. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Scott. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this interview. Me too. I think what I'd like to start with is, and what we always start with, is a history. Just a bit of history about uh, uh, your life. And what got you into where you are now? And what, how was the road? <laughs> how was the road? Huh? Um, where do you want to start with that? Uh, maybe the influence of your father. How? You, what influence your father had on you? And what he did for a living? Sure. Uh, well, both my mother and my father were scientists. And, um, and basically, I was raised from the get-go as a scientist. Uh, my father was actually working on his PhD when I was born at Purdue University. And my mother was actually working still at that time as a medical technician in one of the labs at Purdue University. Um, so I grew up 
in laboratories and, mic and sitting at microscopes. Um, we used to joke that um, instead of being breastfed, we were microscope fed, um, basically, because that was the most nurturing position my mother ever was could be found in. So I was basically always, I mean, it would do just the way our domestic life was, if you had a question by the time, by the time you, I was five, I could read proficiently. And um, if I had a question, my father would say, uh, look it up. Or go research it. Yeah, so we, I'd go into the, to, into the den library and I would grab the Britannica or I would grab some reference book and I would look it up. And so, basically, um, that was the, the, the really we you know we didn't use the word water. It was H two O. I mean, it was it was kind of extreme in some ways. Mm -hmm. It was just it was science, 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 science. And so, but then my father was also involved in, kind of famously at this point, involved in um, when he got recruited back into the United States uh, Air Force. Um, uh, as he was completing his PhD, he was approached by a, a fellow 8th Army Air, uh, officer named Frank Olson. And Dr. Olson um, basically was a biochemist as well. And he was, um, he was a, f a fellow 8th Air Force individual who uh, also was a Purdue alumnus, and he approached my father and said, we need you for this biological warfare program. It's highly compartmentalized. Um, it'll be very restricted. You won't be able to communicate to family what you're doing, um, but you have a skill of strategic importance in the United States government, and you are still technically in the Air Force Reserves, and so we are calling you up. And so as soon as my father got his Ph.D., we moved to Frederick, Maryland, and um, he proceeded to work on this program. Well, I didn't, of course, I was just a, a baby, and so I didn't really have any cognizance of what was going on. I had an eidetic memory, and so I remember, for example, Roscoe Hillencoder, uh, who was the head of the CIA, and, and Frank Olson and people like that eating dinner at our house in Frederick, Maryland. But I... Um, I didn't really have a clue who these people were at the time. Um, I just know because I had an identic memory that, you know, when I saw their photographs, I said, oh, well, you know, I asked my mom. So Roscoe Hillicoder at her house. Oh, she, yeah, she, he had dinner at her house three times. So it's actually been corroborated. But, but then the, the thing is that in 1967, on the seventh anniversary of my father's death, um, and again, that's kind of a well-known, by some people anyway, it's a well-known story. He was actually in, injected with a virus that he had isolated um, at the biological warfare laboratories. And it was a retrovirus that causes a form of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, until 1967, on April 3rd, 1967, I found his journals buried in the mineral insulation of my mother's attic um, when I was putting out mouse traps. Um, I thought that he had died of natural causes, and uh, did he write something in the journal that would? would oh yeah, well he wrote. Oh, he wrote a lot in the journal that, and he he basically talked about how he knew that Frank Olson hadn't committed suicide, how he had filed an internal complaint for further investigation, and and he was very angry that um, Frank Olson's death had been written off as a suicide because he didn't believe that Frank had jumped out of the window of the hotel in New York at all. And um, he was told that he was going to be, um, his pay grade was going to be increased. He was just, he was a postgraduate student. He was working on a postdoc. Right. And, um, and in virology and bacteriology. And um, so they basically um, told him, you know, we're going to give you this injection and then you can be allowed into a part of the lab that Frank was allowed into, but you haven't been allowed into yet. And and he couldn't imagine what that was because he'd been exposed to so many, like he said to uh, one of his uh, dissertation advisors at Purdue was a guy named Dr. Quackenbush. His real name was Quackenbush. And, and in a letter that my father wrote to him that turned up in some of the documents that we were going through, um, 
he said um, he had a, um, a carbon copy of it that he had kept. And he said, there are things that have strained even my very vivid imagination. And this was just in his first two weeks at, at you know, Dietrich. Mm-hmm. And it turned out the things that had strained his very vivid imagination had to do with um, a war that the people of the United States of America have been kept in the dark about. And that was trying to find a way to to kill an alien species whose air superiority was obviously so great that they could run circles around anything we had, and they still can, by the way. And um, so this was a this was a biological. Um, they were looking for biological ways looking, to kill right, them. That's right. They were looking for some way to weaknesses. Trans- to transfect, yeah, because they there was an awareness. I mean, you have to remember that there was none of this was public information back then. Whitley Strieber and all these guys didn't exist yet. And so there was nothing except for a life. I mean, I had these experiences with flying saucers a lot that I just wrote off as dreams, you know. And, um, you know, it didn't matter where we went. We had, our family had various places uh, around the country where we had like summer retreats and stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I, and I had these experiences, you know, they, and I would be found wandering around outside in New Hampshire, outside near Newfound Lake, you know? And so they used to have to put bars across the, um, uh, the stairways and stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. Did they, your, did your father date um, the journal Entries? Oh yes, 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 he did. So yeah. when was he talking about the alien? He was, aspect? he was. Oh, he was, he was talking about the alien aspect from the very beginning. So this is 1953. 1953. Awesome. Um, 1950, actually 1952 and 1953. There were there were entries regarding that. Um, and then uh, in January of 1954, uh, he was injected, and again he was told that this was. And uh, kind of a vaccination in preparation for the next level of security clearance. And instead what happened was he ran a very, very high fever for several days. I mean, 103 plus for several days. And they reduced him to a reader, which of course was not acceptable to him because he'd had the highest security clearance you could get. And he's And he said, I'm not a GD reader. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be an analyst. I'm not a reader. I'm a, I'm a chemist. I'm a scientist. And um, he and a guy named, he was helped out. Cause there was kind of a, a, I wouldn't call it exactly a full-on rebellion, but it was kind of a full-on rebellion. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Murphy, Captain Murphy, and um, a, uh, Bob Harper. There were a number of guys who all moved en masse out to Park Forest, Illinois, which was the template for... United States suburbia at the time was developed by a guy named Kluchnik, and there's a rather famous book about it that's in this, and a little display in the Smithsonian Museum of Science and Industry. There's a little shrine to my hometown where I grew up, uh, Park Forest, Illinois. Okay. And, um, and basically, um, it was all, it was like the highest concentration of PhDs in the world. And most of these guys were former military guys, almost all of them. And, um, and working on secret projects. And working on secret projects. Yeah, my dad was uh, a radar navigator in World War II on B-17s and had his first, ex- well, his, his first conscious experience with uh, alien aircraft when he was flying in, in B-17 8th Air Force squadrons. And uh, they used to call these craft Foo Fighters that yeah, flew in and out of the, for- of the formations. And his life was saved by one one day. Uh, interesting to note, he was flying along the, they had been, they just replaced the lead plane in, in the formation because the lead plane had been shot down. And um, when they when they replaced the lead plane, he was, like I said, he was a radar navigator. So this is a, a, a B-17G, um, which had which had a different configuration than than the F because it had this radar dome on some of the planes. They were called Mickey operators because they could operate either from the Norden bomb site or they and and they had this electronic screen so that if there was cloud cover. They could use radar to to sight the target 
through the radar. And he actually got the Distinguished Flying Cross and, Oak, and the Air Medal and Oak Leaf Clusters and Stars out the wazoo. Um, was talked about, the, one of the last people that Franklin Roosevelt talked about before he, he died. Um, okay. Actually, it was my father in this bombing mission, why he got the Distinguished Flying Cross. So on this mission, um, at this point, this very bright light traveling at, at speeds that were unimaginable at the time. You have to remember that the Germans had just come out with the first jet engines. Right. Um, Messerschmitt and, and I think Fokker Wolf also had a version. but um, And they had a couple other weird little inventions like rocket planes and rocket gliders. And I mean, the Germans at that point were kind of desperately scrambling to save their asses. And you can't blame them because we were bombing the living hell out of them. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so this thing came that you know, sitting. He was actually there had been a radar f- problem with the electronics, and so he was sitting at the northern bomb site in the front of the plane, which is a kind of a plexiglass dome, and this bright light came screaming towards the front, uh, towards him, and as it as it approached the nose of the aircraft, um, he heard the words "Harvey jump," and he said. It wasn't like there was any interpretive barrier. He just leapt out of the seat, which was bolted to the floor, of course, and um, and this piece of shrapnel, flak um, shrapnel, came right up through the tube, blew the the uh, the seat apart. Mm. He, you know, he he, re- he was injured by the shrapnel slightly, but his. But his behind wasn't blown off. Yeah, and but he, he got and, to live, yeah. And he, and he got to live. And, and he said in the next few moments, which seemed, he said, like, he said it, well, he, well his exact word in his writing was it seemed like an eternity. But, you know, I, you know, and I never got to converse with him about this because I discovered it after he, seven years after he had died, actually. So. Right. Uh, but uh, the fact is that um, he said that in that, in that, in those few moments afterwards, which seemed like an eternity, he had this very intense. I we would call it now a download. He didn't call it a download. There, he had a piece. He called it an epiphany, of of that he was going to survive the war and that he was going to survive the war for a reason, and that he, he knew that he was going to die and. And but before he died, that he would have accomplished a couple things to set things in motion for the next step. Right. And um, so you can imagine me, young Republican, sitting reading this at the age of fifteen, and kind of precocious, um, and, and kind of a weird kid in some ways. Um, I mean, not weird in any kind of terrible way, but I mean, you know, I was kind of geeky and interested in. In stuff, I wasn't. It wasn't so much about school as it was about um, just. I was. I started writing papers in astrophysics when I was in my teens, and and about quasi-stellar objects. And didn't they? I, didn't they I, give you an IQ que- test, or did that come later? No, it actually came when I transferred from a, a Catholic grade school to a public grade school. And and the reason my father, before he died, pulled me out of the Catholic grade school was because they said I was learning challenged. I was, I was learning disabled actually. And he said, nonsense. He's been reading since, you know, he's four and a half. Of course, my sister taught me how to read, but um, it wasn't just that I just sat down and picked up a book and started reading. But the thing is that like, um, he knew it was BS, and he just said, um, and so they gave me a battery of tests to find out if I needed, you know, to be in that special section, which they, see, back then we had band and art, and, you know, people who were learning disabled or learning challenged um, had special programs, you know, because yeah. there, was fe- there was federal funding, and we actually had a prosperous economy. Um, and the United States of America was the leader of the world, and we had one of the best educational systems in the world as well. So... That was then. Um, and uh, basically, uh, they gave me a test, and I scored anomalously high on that test. And then they gave me a second test to, they, assuming that it was going to come back much worse. And instead, it came out even better. And then they gave me a third test. and um, The third test you, you didn't want to do, you were like... And the third test was like I said. I said. I said at the third test. I said, you know, that yeah, fundamentally, what do you get? What do you? What? Why? 
You know, my, I'm not retarded. I don't care what anybody says. And they said, no, 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 we know you're not retarded. And then Mrs. Craigle, my third grade teacher, came over and sat at the kitchen table with my mother, and I was asked to leave the room. But, of course, as all children will do, I kind of hovered at the end of the hallway, which was across the dining room from the kitchen, and, and, and eavesdropped on the conversation where I discovered that they – and she was first saying, we don't know what to do with him. He, we're, the school is really not equipped to handle anybody with his IQ. And my mother said, really? Is it that bad? And, and, and my third grade teacher, who was just, I still remember her face really clearly. She was really beautiful. Uh, <laughs> she said, uh, she goes, no, it's just the opposite. We, we, we're not prepared to, we don't know how to, how to relate to him even. Mm. And he should really be in a, in a private school that, where he's being related to in, the, in a way, that, a manner that's appropriate for his IQ. Do you remember the numbers? But yeah, I don't talk about the numbers. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But the, it, 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 and my father, my grandfather, actually on my mother's side, was involved in the development of the IQ test as a as a subject, not as a researcher. When he was at the University of Chicago in the early 1900s, and um, he uh, he was a, he was a psychologist, and um, and he kept scoring over 200. And so they had to keep moving the goalpost, and they had to keep moving 200. Right. And and I have a kind of attitude that he had, which is that. It's a culturally biased test in many ways. Um, it's, a, it's a left brain bias test. It, thank God that it wasn't, in, thank God because of people like my grandfather, um, they have the abstract logic, abstract reasoning portion of the test, which basically we scored rather high on um, and um, really high on. And it's like, because some of our, some of our brains basically both halves really work and, um, at least in some small percentage. I mean, you know, the embarrassment we have as a species is the fact that we've been devolving. And um, we, we kind of talk about almost cavalierly that we only use 5 to 10% of our brain. Um, when, point of fact, I've been involved in a lot of brain research at this point in my life, a lot. I mean, decades and decades and decades and decades going back to my teens. And... Um, and I can tell you that when we are able to use more of our brain, the, the intelligence that is native to our species is, is something that is so far superior to that which is indicated on the evening news that it's, it's remarkable. And, and our educational systems could take advantage of technologies which have been frequently developed at the expense of the U.S. taxpayer and the Canadian taxpayer to a certain degree, because Canada has also been cooperatively involved in several of these programs, um, as has the, you know, the UK. Um, and, um, you know, and Germany to a certain degree, but Germans have been, they, they actually been using this more. And that's a, that's a whole other subject that we could get into perhaps later. Okay. But the fact, the fact is that, 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 Let's say somebody has an IQ of 200, and we just go, okay, oh, my God. You know, people have that kind of response to that. It, it's, it's mediocre to have an IQ of 200, in my opinion, um, not because I feel so superior to everybody else or anything like that. It's because I have seen that after having been told I had a really high IQ, that I was only really, really using a really small portion of this brain. And, and that as I was able to synaptically integrate more and more um, through these programs that I was involved with, um, that uh, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing gift that we have. And, right. we're, not, and we're not using it. And we're not it's, using it. And, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's a fatal error. You know, it's like, it's like, the, it's like the special blue screen. Uh, for the species, and um, we, we either we either get our act together and start using the gift that we are given, and the gifts that we are given, or we will soon be extinct. And right. I think and I think this time, every other cycle, we have managed to climb our way out of the um, the muck. Uh, or the caves, you know, the Hopis have their whole legend about the ant people and right. 
and living underground and 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 I think that this has happened cyclically over and over again but this that's again another kind of tangent so I got so when I discovered my father's notes going back to 1967 again, which I'll I'll just interject here and say which if you've never heard Adam Trombley talk before you're going to eventually get used to this um, we jump around a lot, but we cover a lot of areas. The thing is that Adam's mind is like a vault full of information, and we're just pulling files out of it. That's all we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, getting back but, to your getting okay. back to your father's so, journal. Yeah, it's 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 like um, we have this. Um, it, it was for me. It was this moment where. Um, it was like I, you know, it was it was such a shock to my system to read my own father's words about these things, and that they weren't like goofy science fiction, um, and that he was really deeply troubled by this contradiction of the United States government and Eisenhower's decision not to talk to the public about it, and Truman's before him. And the fight between Vandenberg and Hillencoder, because Hillencoder really felt like we should go to the public. And then he was replaced by Dulles. And, of course, that was a, a, what, what my father called a, a catastrophe to the culture of central intelligence. Um, he was not a big fan of Dulles. Mm. Um, but it, it's, you see, from my perspective at this stage of my life, what he, the dilemma he was dealing with um, goes all the way back to the turn of the century with Nikola Tesla as well. Right. And so, but, but his dilemma was that, and he knew Forrestal, and he, and he knew that Forrestal had been murdered. He knew Frank Olson had been murdered. He knew Forrestal wanted to go public about aliens. And, and, and it was just like there's this group of people who basically are kind of, they kind of have a plutocracy going on. You know, did your ha did your dad have any uh, di reflections in the journal? I mean, this must be hitting you like a ton of bricks. Um, you're reading your dad's secret journals that he had hid away that you found after he had died. And uh, did he have any thoughts about why they wanted to keep this information secret? Like, or did he just was just uh, miffed by it? No, he actually did have a, a an idea of why they were keeping it secret. He 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 knew what the arguments were, and, and basically they were elitist arguments. They were arguments that the human species wasn't um, prepared. Um, it would cause it would cause a special ontological crisis, like an existential crisis, would occur. That and and it was and it was about control in his opinion and more than anything else that it would become much harder to control things uh, it's kind of like if you have um and if you have a, a a cosmology that includes i mean which is the absurdity of our cosmology not including other life forms from other places in this universe is just ridiculous i mean it's it's sub brain dead and right. And it's it's an embarrassment. It's 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 not it's it's not even close to human. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's kind of like um, he was confronted with this fact that these guys knew they knew early on that there were abductions happening. They knew early on that this was occurring, and this was seen as a vector for infection, for transfection, and. Um, he knew he knew all the way back in the you know we're talking about 1952 1953 1954 he knew that um and Hillencoder knew and 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 it it was like okay who are these beings they knew that there was more than one kind but the thing that he said that was so interesting was he said i think that the primary reason this is being kept from the public isn't because they feel like it's going to create an ontological crisis because there are aliens, quote unquote. He said, I think it's because then we would have to talk about the superior physics demonstrated by their craft and that absolutely do not depend on any of the physics that we teach at any of our universities in the world. And, um, and that's really the crux of it. And and the fact that there are these 
technologies. Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but, you know, once I read my father's notes, I began to not go into this kind of cognitive dissonance that we're programmed to go into. Right. Um, and I began to retain and recall seeing things. And I was very careful. I was cautioned by a couple of people not to disclose this or else I would be incarcerated. They told me, quite frankly, you will be incarcerated if you do. And I said, fine. So I kept these things to myself. Even my best friends, you know, unless they had an experience like two of my good friends in high school had this experience that, that we were in, we had a 600 acre wood that we grew up in. And, um, and we had this wonderful kind of campsite with the, you know, singing stream next to it in this kind of post glacial deciduous climax forest. It was absolutely amazing. Three, three to four foot thick topsoil. I mean, astonishing place. Um, which still exists today, uh, because we preserved it. That was one of my first echo tasks okay. with my friends. And um, and they had seen a craft land, and they had seen the occupants get out, and they were completely, like, jazzed about it, you know. And now I talk to one of those pre people on a fairly regular basis, and he is under the impression that it, it's something that never happened. And, um, and it's, it's, this is, this has happened over and over again. So my father saw this, my father saw that these, there were people who wanted to exploit the fact that we had captured enough in the wreckage, not just from Roswell, but from a couple other incidents that are not even publicly known, basically, that we had captured enough of this technology to try to reverse engineer it. And that it wasn't just about superior technology in terms of physical, generative, you know, or flying technology. It was also about a severe, a much superior evolutionary state of being. Right. Uh, not not necessarily because the the concentration of brain mass was that much greater, but because the integration of brain mass was that much greater. So it's not just a nuts and bolts UFO no, story. It, it, exactly. Right. And so, so his, he was divided, he was in, in his own mind in a quandary about this and, and it had a problem with this whole thing. And he, and he also knew that the Germans, he had very high level. I mean, you know, Frank Olson was the main liaison and this was pointed out to me by Daniel Sheehan, who had uh, handled a case where another person who was involved uh, with this post-World War II Central Intelligence Group um, uh, was, you know, they, would, they, they basically were integrated into an understanding of this kind of cult of science, a Teutonic thing that went on in Nazi Germany. And they had like a castle and... I mean, yep, they, had I this place, they had this place where they studied and they brought these guys in to understand about the fact that there was this Nordic kind of alien species that they were talking to and, these, and tried to develop craft. Uh, Schauberger was involved in the program. There were a number of different people who were involved in the program at that time. It's called the Vril program, B-R-I-L. Yeah. And the, yeah. other, the other group was called the Tula and they the were Tula. more of the, the, Tula, the Thula or Tula, and they were more into the esoteric occult aspect. Well, yeah, they, well, well, they were, yeah. And Andre Puharitz was one of the main people who interfaced on that, along with Frank. And, of course, Andre Puharitz went off into the psychic warfare development issues um, and uh, began doing that um, in the early 1950s. And all the things he did um, in Maine initially and then later in Ossingen in New York, um, experimenting on inmates at Sinsing uh, with, with lysergic acid, diethyl, Mi-25, and other things, and, mm -hmm. and, and studying psychic phenomena and, and actually creating a catalog of, of children who were primarily initially the children of people who were for the United States government on classified programs, which is how we got integrated into it. And, and, and Puharch had begun, to, he, was, he was an extraordinarily talented hypnotist and abused that sometimes, I might say. But the fact of the matter is at that time in the early 50s, he, he um, basically would hypnotize children. Like um, uh, we would be taken to Bethesda by our mothers 
And, uh, and so are you saying you were part of that program? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. For sure. Yeah. It's called the star child program. And, and there was a group of us. Uh, one of the things that happened, uh, and Andre Perharch was in charge of it. And, uh, for years, even after he claimed to be, uh, being tortured by the federal government, he was still very much involved. And uh, R.J. Riddles III, who was one of the reasons why I survived on this planet when I was being uh, financially cut off and every other way cut off. Um, but that's, again, jumping ahead quite a bit. But but the fact of the matter is that, that he had a catalog. And, and basically what would happen under hypnosis is these children, I'm, I'm talking about two-year-old, three-year-old children sometimes, do you remember how old you are when you started? Two. Okay. And um, and basically, um, in the process, um, you know, these children would say things about where they came from. You know, that, oh, I didn't come from this planet. You know, so this isn't George Harrison after he's taken acid and says, I think I woke up in the wrong world, which, of course, millions and millions of us did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but... Um, this is little kids who have absolutely no frame of reference at all. No way that they could have achieved a frame of reference even in terms of acquiring information. They, they didn't have those acquisition skills, let alone any kind of exposure. And, and these children were saying things that were, were like talking to an alien species and so well that sort to, of they that sort of to, backs up what another guest of ours said uh we had a guest on um just recently about uh, reincarnation and he said right up to the age of seven children are working on the template of what they've done previously in previous lives well it's especially just, especially in cultures where where that's part of the cultural cosmology um, I mean, you know, where that's acceptable, you know, it's, it's in our culture, it is like considered to be Shirley MacLaine-esque and, uh, and I'm not saying anything negative about Shirley at all. She's, she's, I'm sure in many ways, a very delightful person. Um, and I'm, I, so I'm not saying anything negative about that. What I am saying is that we have this kind of attitude that was dismissive sometimes about that. Um, there's a lot of people who believe in reincarnation, though. And don't get me wrong. There's certainly many, many tens of millions more in the United States and Canada who do now than did in the 1960s. Right. And there's been a huge cultural revolution and a cosmological revolution that has had that that hasn't even really been integrated at all into our education. Not even a little bit, you know. And that's a whole other that's a whole other thing that we can talk about later too. So, so you the were bottom, you, the bottom line on this whole thing is that is that this was all a part of it. You know, this is like so from the earliest moments of my life, literally, um, you know, f- f- literally right after not long after I was born, we go off to Frederick, Maryland. My father's involved in this biological warfare program. I mean, you know, we have the head of the CIA eating dinner in our house. We have, you know, Vandenberg and Hill and Coder were at each other's throats half the time because Vandenberg wanted to control it because it was about the control of airspace from his perspective. Hill and Coder wanted to control it because it was the, it was about intelligence as far as he was concerned. And Truman had actually been the one before he before he was no longer in charge. Uh, Truman was actually the one who basically said, "No, we're going to make this a joint program." between the United States Air Force and the Central Intelligence Agency. So Truman's the, act, the actual guy who created that. Um, it was kind of a brilliant political move because he saw no other way to resolve it. Right. And um, my father was aware of all this. My father was aware that, like I said, my father was aware that when Forrestal wanted, wanted to go public um, about the whole presence of aliens and the Roswell and other incidents, that he was put into um, watch over at Bethesda, and um, basically they said he that he hung himself out the window. And my father didn't believe for a second that Forrestal had killed himself any more than he believed that Frank Olson had. And of course, years years later, um, Eric Olson, Frank's son, um, uh, basically had him exhumed in 1993. And that's kind of a famous story where three forensic pathologists, some of the top forensic pathologists in the country, examined a very, very well-preserved uh, body 
um, which was a testimony to the embalmer strait, I guess you could say, and discovered that he had been killed by blood force trauma prior to, because they had, you know, they had the pictures of Frank on top of the car that right. he landed on. So they knew exactly what the head position was, et cetera, et cetera, and, what, and, and any object that he could have struck on the way. And there was nothing that was like this dent in his skull and this, this, this uh, anti-mortem um, hematoma that, that wasn't fully developed, of course, because he died almost instantly thereafter. But, I mean, there was a bleed that happened anti-mortem that indicated blood force trauma pr prior to him leaving, you know, leaping out the window, which he, of course, didn't do, but he was thrown out the window, mm. so they could call it a suicide. My father was totally freaked out by this, because, right. you mean, in the first place, I mean, Forrestal gets murdered, and then his, then his good friend and colleague, Frank Olson, gets murdered, and they have, and they, he and, he, they both have, they both have integration into both aspects of these programs, the Thule program as well, and not just, it wasn't just the Brill, but it was also the Thrill program. They knew about this stuff. Right. And my father, my father's best friend when he died was a former SS officer, strange to say. Um, uh, you know, they developed the machine that made hot dogs safe for human consumption, skinless hot dogs safe for human consumption. Right. Um, and he got the Industrial Research and Development Award, blah, 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 posthumously. Um, and, um, and, you know, and then his colleagues started to be taken out. Bob Harper was taken out suddenly. And, you know, another one of his colleagues spontaneously combusted sitting in his easy chair. I mean, there were just weird things that happened. And, um, and you know, and, and, of course, this meant that I, you know, there was this kind of unusual kind of surveillance you could call it mm -hmm. of certain lives that certain people had i mean you know and when i when i was actually approached by rj reynolds finally um he was aware of the star child program he was not aware of my position in it or your involvement uh, yeah but but buharch was and buharch actually uh literally tried to prevent me from becoming an rj reynolds scholar because he um you know, I don't know exactly. I never did get a good explanation from Andrea. We were, we were, we were on friendly terms up to that point, very good terms up until that point. Well, and maybe he just didn't want you getting more recognition so that if you ever did come out and talk about the Star Child program, um, you would have that much more credibility being, you know, having this uh, acc accolade. Well, the only thing he said to me was, I'm the master here. I'm the one who should be getting the funding for Earth research, not you. You should be my apprentice. Okay. And he would, and he, so, I mean, I guess, I guess I can't say I don't know what his motivation was, but it was, it was ego and, you know, it's the corruption of our society. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, had read all this, you were... Uh, I was blown away. I was astonished. Away. I was blown away. And, and it, made, it made total sense to me in a certain sense. But it caused a total uh, ontological and epistemological crisis in my life. I mean, it was a total meltdown that I went through. And, um, and it was quickly resolved ex experientially by an epiphany that occurred. Uh, within the first 24 hours or so of, of me discovering these notes and reading them. It wasn't just discovery. It was, it was probably three days after I discovered them when I think about it. But I, I went through this kind of passage, you know, uh, not exactly, well, a dark moment of the soul. I wouldn't call it a dark night of the soul because it wasn't a prolonged event. Um, and, uh, and, and felt thereafter much more integrated into life. And... And also, at the same time, rather frustrated because there was no one I could talk to. I talked to Thomas Merton about it um, as a confessor. I, I actually went to Gethsemane or get, uh, in Kentucky where he was before he left on his Oriental voyage, which he never returned from. And he was the first person I confided in about this. And um, What was I, the reaction? Well, I confided a couple things into him, um, and his his response was uh, he was quite amazing. He was he was his response was quite accommodating. I don't mean accommodating in a co enabling way, as some people use that term, but I mean accommodating in the sense that he was very open minded. He was a very beautiful being. Mm. He really was. He was a very very beautiful being, and I was. Uh, 
really, really saddened by his killing, by his murder. Of course, which the Catholic Church never acknowledged was a murder, but, gee, he was sitting in a bathtub in Thailand, um, and the, a fan somehow or other found its way into the bathtub, you know, and he got, yeah. electric, and he got electrocuted to death. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, considering what he was up to, considering that he was attracting a, a, a new kind of energy, he was a powerful guy. I mean, he was the kind of guy who, um, you know, honored, I, I, I think honored the, the, the monk's garb that he wore. Right. And he, he honored his tradition, his sacred tradition. And, um, and he was and, and honored in, in the sense of not being dogmatically bound by the strictures of a lot of it. Right. And ex- willing to explore things, but so it was. But uh, over time, what happened was that, I mean, I realized that the physics that I mean, when you, when I started cognizing and started remembering and started being able to hold my attention, like the next time I saw a craft, I was able to hold my attention for quite a while on it, and it was. And it was a communicative moment. It was a moment where I realized that this thing was being the communication of a different kind of physics. And I began to have these insights um, that I had to keep very quiet about because as I was going through the process of my education, I, I, I never confided in any of my professors um, except for Bucky. Buck and Mr. Fuller. It, and Buck, Buck Mr. Fuller was the next person after Thomas Burton. And I met him not long after actually very almost the same time so like uh, synchronicity after these events synchronicity pushed your life forward into meeting oh, the was, sort of oh, people yeah. that you needed to meet to do yeah. what you need to do from then on because yeah, now yeah. we're moving into your free energy yeah so. i mean it was like it was like there was there was this i call it choreography of my life that i began to become conscious of and i re- and i in retrospect i realized that it had been going on the whole time including my father's death strange to say um and that um there was this choreography going on and and somebody a, a guy at Crockenburg Tano's bookstore in Chicago a gal at the University of Chicago Lab School library these a, a guy and another woman at another library at, at the public school that I went to as well um because I couldn't go full time to the lab school at all I couldn't afford it um and and my mother made too much to get a because by that time she was a hematologist head of hematology at a major hospital um so uh basically you know that yeah you you see you see that there is this the more that we avail ourselves to the intrinsic awareness and the intrinsic intelligence of existence itself the more we open ourselves to that um it, it doesn't have to be within the framework of a specific religious belief system um necessarily at all i mean in a, in in some ways it's it's liberating not to have to be i mean i'm a um I'm saying that I'm saying that having a very very uh, multicultural background, you know, Catholic and Jewish and Buddhist by right. by reincarnation, and American Indian and Native I mean Native American as well, and so um, I have, you know, an appreciation for the different kind of perspectives that different cultural orientations provide, but we are. In desperate need of understanding that um, that that in quantum physics we talk about a lot. I mean, you know, John Archibald Wheeler and I. I was very blessed to have some really wonderful conversations with him, and and others. And David Bohm, for example. There's a, there's there's there, the more people get into quantum physics, really get into it, and the more you understand things like entanglement. Action at a spooky action is a distance, what what Einstein called yeah. spooky action at a distance. The more you understand things like this, the more you understand that consciousness is intrinsic to the process. It isn't it isn't a byproduct of of neurochemistry. And the scientific materialists would have us isolate our brains and say, oh, the whole thing, all your emotions and all this stuff is just biochemistry in your brain, neurochemistry. You know, different production of neuropeptides, etc. Um, it's, it's of course nonsense. 
um, because consciousness itself is intrinsic. But again, um, that's leaping pretty far ahead here in the conversation. Yeah. Oh, I was and, and, and Mr. Fuller. And, yeah. And I think that like when I met Fuller, it was, uh, you know, uh, some friends and I actually uh, were, and I were sitting and we were talking and we decided to drive down to Carbondale to see Bucky Fuller talk. And, um, we went down and we actually got there half an hour after it started. And there were some seats close to the front that were still open. So we, walked right up to the front and, and sat down like you own the place. <laughs> and, um, and you know, and he went on and talked and talked and talked until one something in the morning. And by the time he stopped, there were eight of us left in the auditorium and he'd given everybody permission to leave on three or four different occasions. He says, please feel at any time where you have reached your capacity. I don't want you to be overwhelmed you know, and, and he says, you, you completely don't have to stand on any kind of politic here. You can, you can leave and, and don't be embarrassed to do so. And so people did. I mean, and obviously people who were there were used to being able to do this because, because he went on and on because he was a comprehensivist. He was not a specialist. He was, he was somebody who appreciated the power of the brain very, very differently than Anybody I knew, and I, like I said, I was surrounded by PhDs and MDs and and accomplished people from a conventional perspective, who who still only used a small percentage of their brains. Bucky, on the other hand, was this kind of renegade guy out there who'd been kicked out of Harvard twice and et cetera, et cetera, and he and and who was the head of the design department at a state school called Southern Illinois University of Carbondale, and. Um, and it just was the, it was the it was the most exciting thing I'd ever heard in my life in terms of uh, a presentation being given by an academic, and I'd heard a lot of them um, by that point. And um, I think I was seventeen at the time. I was sixteen at the time. Sixteen. I was sixteen at the time. I was almost seventeen at the time. Um, you know, just and- that, just the fact that you can say. I was 16 going on 17 or 17 years old, and I had heard a lot of academic lectures. Um, that's unusual by itself. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, my mother dated, a couple of years after my father died, my mother dated the head of paleontology at the Field Museum. So I had complete, I was like the young prince of the paleontology section. I could go wherever I wanted to go and you know, hold dinosaur bones and save tooth tiger skulls and I mean, you know, and this is a guy who'd gone off in search of the Yeti and came back with scientific evidence for its reality and was completely convinced of it. And then he got hit with the, you know, with the with the invisible wall. Right, know, right. The he, academic, the he, academic stick. You just can't. You, it, it's it's hard. I mean, and it's so funny. I mean, I have, I have so much experience with this and in, in my life my sister made major breakthrough in cancer research and was you know was unable to basically get her message across exactly she actually delivered a paper that made the statement of this discovery even though it contradicted eight of the top people including her own boss um it, it her own paper contradicted them and so therefore they made her keep doing redoing these experiments and and and, and now it's part of the just common knowledge of molecular biophysics, you know, and physics and, and, and molecular biology. I mean, everybody knows, uh, you know, what she was saying back then that was so controversial is true. And this is what happens. This is, this is this normal. Is, this is normal. And, and this is the moment of inertia. So, we get so listening to Bucky such, was such not normal. People run things. Yes. Looking at, listening to Bucky was such a, was such a breath of fresh air. I mean, here was a guy who, um, wasn't limited into, he said, he said, the, see, the problem is, he said that people have to emerge out the other side of the light cone. He said that, you know, the light cone focuses down to a point and then emerges out the other side and expands out to infinity. He said, you know, you can't, you, what's happening with over-specialization, he, would, he pointed out, was that we would focus down to this fine point and we would never really become worthy of the term doctor of philosophy, because when you become a doctor of philosophy, he would say that it was because you could make philosophy because you had integrated your discovery that you had made focusing in on a very fine point back into the 
the whole body of information that is available at any one time. You had made your you had made an initial contribution, and 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 so therefore, it wasn't just that you'd focused down in this infinitesimal point of quantum physics, for example, and you had studied this one little thing in biochemistry, or you'd studied this one little thing in molecular biology, or whatever it was. It wasn't that that made you um, a doctor of philosophy. Which, which he said, it, what what made you a doctor? Of what should it? Which was originally intended to do, was that now you could be you could wax philosophical in the sense that you you had integrated that that bit of information that you had gleaned in that process of your dissertation studies, and and you and now integrating that you had developed the skill for focusing in on a fine point and reintegrating the fine point. And and we he pointed out to me at a very early age, sitting in his living room on South Forest, which I I mean he was very strict about meeting secretly, because he was kind of a celebrity back then, and so I I had a house over on uh, Poplar South Poplar, which is not that far from me where he was, and um, the bottom line is that that he would sit and talk all night, and he pointed out to me one night uh, a lucite. Um, brain that John Lilly had actually sent him uh, and uh, and he said what does this remind you of I think it's about 2 30 in the morning that, and and I said what it he says besides the obvious what does this remind you of and I said an intestine looking at the cerebral cortex right right um, and he says exactly he says exactly he said the brain is is the function of the brain is to integrate 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 it's the function of the brain is to receive sensory data and information and and to digest it like the intestine digests you don't think about digesting your dinner the body has this genius built into it and he says and you don't think about um those processes like going through and saying well i need to produce more more, I need a little more acid here. Or I need, you know, to digest this steak I just ate. So if, he said, in terms of information, he says, if we just let the brain do what it does, it will digest the sensory input. It will digest the data, the information, and it will and it will reject the stuff that isn't true. It will just reject it. He says. He says, I believe that people fundamentally have a sense of truth a sense of what is real and and they have a sense of what is not real and and therefore you need to learn how to learn he said so intensively focus on one subject at a time he says and 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 learn how to titrate learn how to how what what is your intake what is your intake level that you can tolerate you know, so you study and you study and you study and you focus on this one subject and you it's like, OK, I'm not crying for an exam. I'm, I'm studying this so I can learn it. And then he says, go out to Giant City State Park or Devil's Kitchen State Park or something and lean up against a tree and just breathe the air and let the brain do its work. And he said, and, and if you learn this as a discipline, if you learn how to how to modulate and moderate your intake of information and sensory information as well, sensory input. He says, and learn how to relax and to, and to have confidence that the brain is this remarkable structure which is orders and orders and orders of magnitude of anything that we had accomplished at the time in terms of computers and, and that we have over a trillion synaptic integrations that are possible in any given moment. He said, he said this, is, this is an extraordinary computer, it's an extraordinary processor. Let it do its work. And, and, and the more we relax into it, the more our intelligence is revealed to us. You know, we become empowered through this process. We suddenly, it's not so much that I'm so intelligent. It's that you realize that there is this intelligence that is already existing. I didn't create it. I, I, I arise and, and you arise and we all arise as modifications of its context. And, uh, and this isn't a religious statement or a philosophical statement. It's literally true. Right. I mean, what kind of genius does it take 
for life to exist, but but to, to perpetuate life, to sustain life. Now, that does require a different kind of incarnation of genius, which we're not doing right now. Right. So, that sort of explains, so, that sort so of explains was, how this, much programming is out there, how much you have to dodge the programming that is, and why there's so much of it in the entertainment industry, in the, you know, the sports industry, you can just consider that a distraction, uh, you know, look over there, pick a team, um, all kinds of different areas that are built into our system as distractions and, and taking everything in small bites, because to take something a large bite, you might understand it. Well, the educational system uh, and it, of course, my primary understanding of the failure of the educational system has to do with the failure of the United States educational system, which is not a total failure, by the way. There are areas where it shines, um, where, st- where, where students have a culturally conducive environment or they transcend a non-conducive environment. Um, and, and basically, because of their, their hunger for learning, um, focus and um, and learn and grow and so it is possible in our educational system for people to do to, to get a good foundation I, I believe my daughter got a rather good foundation at the school she went to I was we were very careful to pick out specific schools and I actually had to start a grade school for along with some friends in California for her and her friends because we were not satisfied with what was available so we, instead of homeschooling, we created a cultural environment, and um, those those kids have done very, very, very well in life, actually. And um, but the thing is that um, we 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 look at this whole situation as it is right now, and we see this kind of headless horseman kind of syndrome. We see we see a body acting without intelligence, kind of. Uh, running around destroying rainforests, running around polluting and poisoning the water in the air, um, it, you know, it, and putting fluoride into the water, which makes people docile, right. um, which was used in Auschwitz to make people docile, impotent, and sterile. Okay, it's a poison, for Christ's sakes. I mean, it has the skull and crossbones all over the container for a reason, because fluoride's a really significant poison. But we do all these things. There's so much. I recently gave an interview with uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, as you know, at Solari, at Coast to Coast. And, um, and basically, we talked a lot about entrainment. And, and what you just brought up, of course, is regarding that. Back then, in 1968, there wasn't so much information about entrainment. Puharich, right. Puharich had followed up for the United States military, for the, for the Department of Defense. He had followed up on uh, certain psychics, very specific psychics, who had tormented the Gestapo in various locations, and the Gestapo would move from one place to another, wouldn't even hang the Nazi flag out in front of their offices. And this guy, when they were just moving the furniture over, would blow the place up. And it was because he, he knew ahead of time what they were doing. Things like this, right. of course, got the attention of the United States military. And, and as did the fact that alpha entrainment was used at Nuremberg Stadium and over all the broadcast media in Germany. Now, during, when you say alpha training, what do you mean by alpha training? Alpha, alpha entrainment. Um, it means there's a, there's a, a mechanism in, in the human neurophysiology called frequency following response and it's it whatever you can say its origins are it goes back as far as we can look back i mean i've been in in very primitive situations in africa and in brazil in particular where even in, in people living in relatively primitive states in the middle of a jungle i mean i'm talking about primitive states in terms of technological development etc I mean, right. no tech, no technological development except for fire, basically, and pointy sticks um, making a compound and hammocks in right. Brazil. Uh, but these people, basically, with that kind of environment, um, had rhythms. They had music. They they had patterns. They repeated ritualistically, um, and and that ritual repetition 
is the earliest form, and those repeating rhythms are the earliest form of entrainment, are they the earliest form of group entrainment. And uh, frequency following response is the response of the brain to whether it's through the optical pathway or through the, the, um, the oral pathway of, the, of hearing, oral, A-U-R-A-L. Um, basically, the brain will go into a certain kind of rhythm following a rhythm that you're hearing repeated to you over and over again. One of the reasons some of the rhythms that are, are in music, so-called music, sometimes are actually pathogenic. There's a lot of stuff that's on the radio that's actually pathogenic. Right. It's, 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 it's imbalancing. It actually creates severe neural deficits. It, it locks people into... And would this also include tele- television shows? Oh, well, of course it includes television yeah. shows. But so what, what happened was that, the, that this was discovered in Germany, actually before it was, it was in the tw- late 20s, and, um, and they, there were certain frequencies that they began to experiment with, certain tones that they began to experiment with to see which tones, which frequencies would, would, would induce what kind of states. And so... When, when Nuremberg Stadium was designed by Albert Speer, the architect, um, it was acoustically designed as well as, you know, all the other aspects. And uh, they broadcast alpha entrainment. So people's nervous systems were soothed. They were kind of put into – some people think that alpha entrainment is all about a meditative state, but it's actually a suggestible state as much as anything else. Um, when you're using it this kind of, in this kind of environment, it can make you feel like Barack Obama is a savior. It made them feel like Adolf Hitler was a savior for Christ's sakes. Um, and and am I drawing a comparison? Yes, I am actually drawing a comparison, but not between the two individuals, but between the fact that Adolf Hitler was the first political figure whose rise to power was aided by frequency following response and whose sustenance in power was aided by frequency following response because not only Nuremberg Stadium were these things broadcast, but over the radio networks, these were broadcast. And you have to remember this is all monaural back then, so we didn't have the ability that we have now with with binaural and surround sound, which mm-hmm. is which is quite amazing. I mean, the, some of the waveforms that we are now getting entrained to are quite sophisticated and there's no way they're not intentional because there's no way that those things are naturally occurring. Um, John Lilly, I frequently refer to, um, was visiting to us, visiting us here in Aspen in 1990. Actually, he was, he was staying at a, one of the buildings, the, the first office building for, it was a tiny little building for the Institute for Advanced Studies. And um, he was up and he climbed down the ladder from the loft. It was a sleeping loft, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, he, and he climbed down the ladder and I had just um, seated myself at my desk and I just turned on the spectrum analyzer, the signal analyzer that was sitting by my desk at the time, uh, an old Hewlett Packard 3561A. And as the, this, this device warmed up, it was it was hooked up into the neutral in the ground because we'd realized that because we have an open what we call an open neutral loop in the United States grid that we could utilize the entire grid the neutral loop in the grid as an antenna as a giant antenna before that we had gone to some considerable expense a couple hundred thousand dollars to have twenty four thousand miles of wire wound and one of my colleagues who was very adept he was actually an operating engineer as well as being one of the most brilliant engineers. I've ever met um, to this date, without exception. Um, but he he primarily dug the hole. I mean, I think I got on the backhoe and made a couple cuts, but you know, but we buried twenty four thousand miles worth of wire in a hoop outside of Pendleton, Oregon, on an on an Indian reservation there, um, where his his wife was from that tribe. And um, we thought it might help us be more free from federal interference. It didn't exactly turn out that way, but the f- it, the fact is that um, we so that was we were trying to measure Earth resonances, and we were trying to analyze these signals. And one day we realized that we could just hook into the neutral in the ground, and we could we could accomplish the same thing, but with even a greater, I mean, a really really huge antenna. 
if, okay. as, long, as long as we could see beyond the noise, and we learned how to do that. But so in the process of this thing warming up, there was this waveform that appeared, and 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 if you looked at the spectrum, it started at DC and it ended at 100 kilohertz as the thing was warming up, going through its boot up process. This is you have to remember uh, at this stage of the game is a, is a, like an antique. Um, at the, but at that stage of the game, was a, was a, almost a brand new instrument, and um, uh, and so there's this waveform that appeared. It had about a two fold swing, and 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 and, um, and that means that you know the hump went up two volts, and, and on both sides of the wave. And then right. there was there's this hump in the wave, and then there's this pause, and then there's a dip in the wave, and then there's this pause and a hump in the wave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the two reversing. And and then um, he looked at this and he says, "Where's that waveform coming from? What's generating that waveform?" And I said, "That's that's uh, something that's just ambient on the uh, grid." He says, "What? The power grid?" And I said, "The power grid." And he said, "What's it doing on the power grid? Is it is this just at your house or is this really everywhere?" And I said, "Well, no. We've measured it in several different locations in different states as well. I mean." Um, we've seen this same thing every time we start up this instrument. I figured it was an artifact of the internal electronics of the machine. He says, no. He says, I invented that wave. It's called the Lily Wave. I invented huh? that wave. I invented that waveform when I was working with the National Institutes for Mental Health. I, I invented that waveform when we were implanting, we were on Navy contract, we were learning, we were implanting dolphin brains. And we discovered that when we tried to induce sine waves into a dolphin brain, that they would go into epileptic seizures. And uh, because I had a very close relationship with these dolphins, of course, I couldn't torment them or torture them. So I had to find a way that we could induce different kind of su submissive states or instructional states without causing them to go into epileptic seizures. So he says, so I invented this wave. And he says, and you see how, uh, here's, he says, can you pause this? So I paused it. And he says, so here's the rise. You can, anybody can Google the lily wave, by the way, and you'll see a little lily wave um, site will come up. Um, and, um, and, and basically says, so here's the stimulation here and here's the pause and the pause is the response vector pause is what I call it. He says, cause this allows all of those synapses to fire and for there to be a response without feedback happening and having them get overwhelmed and go into seizure states. And I said, oh, that's fascinating. And he says, so, so this is a mind control waveform. He says, can you blow up the wave more? Can you, can you magnify the wave more? He says, of course I can. So I, I made it just the primary window because it's a split window at that point. I made it a primary window. I blew it up. He says, oh, yeah, see? He said that, so they have this primary lily wave intermodulated with all kinds of other stuff. He says, he says those fuckers. He said, pardon my language. He, said, he, says, he says, I can't believe they're doing this. He says, this, see, this is what they did with my research. This is, he says, I knew they were going to do something like this. He says, I just knew it. And, um, and anyway, you know, here, here, and John was from one of the most prominent families in Minnesota, his brothers in the Fed governing body and, and the Federal Reserve and blah, 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 all that stuff, wasn't from a normal family. Um, his father owned Northwest Airlines, right. um, et cetera. So an elite so, family. Yeah, and, and he was wealthy and, and basically not dependent on other people for his funding. So he could do whatever the F he wanted to do. And he was an MD, and he was, you know, extraordinary when it came to neurophysiology and psychiatry and stuff like that and psychology, but especially neurophysiology. And he was really into cetacean research, of course, and interspecial communication. And, and that's, that's a whole other subject I could talk for hours and hours and hours just about John's work. But that moment for me was such an illumination because I had absolutely no idea what this waveform was, none whatsoever. I mean, it didn't even ever occur to me that this was a mind control waveform and that this is why it was on the grid. Right. This is why it's on the power grid. Um, and it's in everybody's home and everybody's harness. It's in Canada. It's in the United States. It's not, it is not universally present because not everybody has the same thing, but it is more and more present in the world. Um, it's it's a form of electromagnetic entrainment, which is another vector of entrainment. Um, and the, the primary vector of entrainment, of course, is from, uh, I shouldn't say of course, but the primary vector of entrainment electromagnetically is the water molecule. And the water molecule can, res can respond to extremely weak, what we call femtotesla, extremely, extremely weak magnetic signatures, signals. And... Um, um, 
this is uh, one of the things that we have to uh, be aware of. And, and, and when harp comes into play in all these things, um, this, is, this, is the, this is the vector of entrainment that's primarily being used in coordination with, like, for example, with mass rally events like the Super Bowl. Okay. The Super Bowl is a huge, massive entrainment event. The World Cup for soccer is a huge, massive global entrainment event where people are actually being synced up and enter into a kind of uh, psychophysical entanglement as a result. And certain kinds of neurochemical states are being intentionally introduced. And this isn't like, I'm not talking about the president of some news network knowing that this is what's happening. I'm not even talking about the president of the United States necessarily knowing everything about what's happening. I'm not sure how much Barack Obama knew and how much he didn't knew know about how much entrainment was being used during his campaign. We'd never seen more sophisticated entrainment, is all I can say. And we'd seen the Republican Party using entrainment for quite a long time, for decades. But we'd never really seen a real sophisticated use of it in the Democratic and the party side of things. And, um, and with Barack Obama, that changed. Um, and we saw the most sophisticated we've ever seen. You know, like Oregon is famously kind of grounded in a certain way. It's not real. Um, they don't, Oregonians are not famous for waxing enthusiastic about politicians and things like that. And yet we had a whole stadium in Oregon when Barack Obama gave a presentation up there, gave a speech up there, who were like people who were religious converts. Um, and this is, of course, what happened with Hitler over and over and over again with audiences back then. Again, this is to draw te- and I, a focus on the technology and not necessarily to say that, that, that Barack Hussein Obama is something like Adolf Hitler right, right. As, as a person. Okay? Hey, you're just talking about the technology I'm talking, that's talking being used. About, I'm talking about the technology that's being used and the fact that almost every statement he made was disingenuous, notwithstanding, okay, um, because it was. There was there were so many. I mean, you know, we're we're going to find a different way to mine coal than to take the tops off of mountains in Appalachia, for example, um, which is where he lost Robert Kennedy Jr. Um, because, of course, they immediately threw the the I consider him to be a war criminal, Ken Salazar, um, and and you know. I, I go to things sometimes where, where these people are present. I'm actually physically present sometimes at gathering where some of these people I'll be mentioning are present. And Ken, so, I mean, so I'm saying this at my own social cost uh, because he's not a good person, okay? Or if he started out as a good person when he was young, what he's doing now isn't good. Let's put it that way. You don't take the tops of these mountains off without dire consequences to the environment. And that's just one thing. And you don't license. I mean, Barack Obama, we were told, I was told by somebody who worked for a very famous newspaper that I should change my attitude because I was kind of early on promoting him back in 2004. Um, and um, basically, I, you know, he told me, you, don't, you need, don't know the whole story here. And this is before we discovered any of the other stuff. So the, 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 the fact is, is that what we need to do is we need to have an understanding that there's a reason why people are passive. There's a reason why people are not responsive on a level of intelligence which is necessary for our own survival as a species. And um, and it sounds and, like it just comes down to control. It it's really all about, just it's comes all about, down to control because all, yeah. if we were honest about it, I mean, if we were completely honest, like just two guys meeting on the street, just saying hey and getting to know each other and treating each other with respect. If the if the rest of the human um, leadership worked that way, then it would be a no-brainer that we would just respect each other enough to bring out these uh, these technologies that are being hidden, bring out this this information about uh, about the human mind's capacity. Stop using entrainment. Stop using programming in in the radio and the television and entertainment and all of these other industries. And I, I can I can back this up myself. I was uh, working with a Sufi uh, back in the days when I, I I felt I needed to know more about who I was. Uh, and uh, you know I made the silly uh, silly move of saying, well, well, 
what can I do to to know more about myself? And he said, you really, you really want to know. You might want to sit down. And he told me, you know, a whole bunch of things about myself I didn't want to hear at the time. And, you know, you got to... You should probably stop watching television. Take the t- take the radio out of your car. Just get rid of that. And uh, if you want to know yourself, you have to have a quiet enough environment to do so. Well, you have, have to you, be able. You have to at least be able to degauss. Yeah. So I did. I, I we haven't had TV for. Well, we're going on sixteen years now. I. Maybe maybe a little longer. I know my 16-year-old son, my 14-year-old son have never seen TV in this house. Um, and uh, I ripped the radio out of my car and didn't listen to music. And, and I was a, a music freak. Uh, that, was a, that was a hard one. But I think that you just need a certain amount of time away. I, I may have gone too far. <laughs> I, I listen to the radio occasionally now. But I, I think you need just a certain time period to step away from things and to integrate yourself enough so that you can be that you can be in amongst those things and not be affected by them. I could be wrong. No, I, I don't think. I think that. I think that it's. I think it's really important that. Um, I mean, I have a different approach to it. Um, I'm. I'm involved with with television, and have been for quite a long time, um, because it is such an extraordinarily powerful medium, and. Um, I've been involved with the media for that reason and music. Um, for that matter, uh, George Martin put Alpha and Trayman into Beatles albums. And so there was a benign application of Alpha and Trayman there. Okay. Um, so you mean helpful? And, yeah, there's a lot of benign applications for entrainment. There's a lot of neurologically and neurophysically healing applications. Post, post uh, stroke, for example, post trauma for example. Uh, but but we are all in a state of shock. All of us are walking around to one degree or another in a state of shock. I mean, how could you be aware of what's going on at all? And I think that we become aware in some small quotient of, and there's a certain amount of awareness we get through the media, through the television, through the radio, um, through the internet, of course. Um, and it's not immune from entrainment, by the way. Um, and... Um, nor the no the inter, you know I mean the internet is a multimedia venue for and it's completely got stuff on it that can can use subliminals to you know encourage your buying mood or your buying of something I mean Bank of America was just testifying somebody from Bank of America was just testifying before Congress the other day they have a patent on a technology that actually in the process of a phone call can change your mood about interacting with the Bank of America. And uh, wow. they have a pat they actually have a patent on the technology. This is how brazen this is. This is this is this is something that technically is against the law and yet they have a patent. And right. because this kind of manipulation start happening with single frame or three or four frames in the process of uh, a commercial on TV that would say buy crest or buy Ipana toothpaste or something. Of course, probably none of your listeners will remember. A few of them will remember that there was once a toothpaste called Ipana. Uh, but the fact, it, it's, the fact is that, um, that that was that was called flash subliminals, and like a flash card was used, and it would and it would be on for a few frames, but not long enough for you to cognize that it was there. And it would say vote for Nixon, or it would say. Or it would say, um, you know, like I said, buy Chevy, you know, buy buy Olds, but you know, it was it would tell you what to do, and they because they started realizing pretty early on, having studied how Hitler rose to power and and the use of this, and not only that, but we became more and more aware of the Soviets as well, and um, how they had integrated a lot of this, and were actually using it eventually as a weapon. Um, we it was beho- it behooved us, which is one of the reasons why. I, I can't be totally enthusiastic about one of our candidates for president, even though he has a lot of good ideas, because he wants us to have no defense department. We, we live in a world where very sophisticated technologies are being used to manipulate people. And they're being used primarily by the global corporate hegemony, which has recently been confirmed in its existence. I think I sent you that link. Yeah. Um, and um, 
Uh, I mean, there is actually, this beast actually exists as a kind of supraneural network on the planet of uh, electronically integrated network. And, and this electronically integrated network can change your body chemistry at will. And um, most people who make movies don't make movies that are that sophisticated. Most people who make TV shows don't do this and ever do this intentionally. But behind the scenes, there have been experiments carried out where flash subliminals have been used integrating into the pixelation on a TV screen, for example. On the, and this is why digital TV screens are so much more uh, viable as a venue for this. Right. Uh, but once you're aware of it, like if I'm watching something and I suddenly have a, a tremendous urge to go eat a pizza, which I don't eat anymore, hardly ever, um, I know that that I got hit with a subliminal. I mean, it's just like I, I just accept it as a part of commerce on this planet. Basically, most of, uh, so much of commerce on this planet is the result of induced states. The, 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 the weakness in, their, in this system, whether they're broadcasting it over HARP, which is only one of those kind of broadcast units in the world. There's several of them around the world uh, at this point. Um, and that's a huge subject in and of itself. Mm. And, um, but then we, and we analyzed those signals and we got, that's when we got, when I went public with the results of our analysis and the little thing I published on the internet back in 1994, it was 10 days, I think later or something like that when we got raided. Even though they used the excuse of one of my colleagues activities um, to to validate and justify the warrant and all those things they came and no. confisca- they came no. and confiscated everything um, basically because this was the equipment that was allowing us to see what was really going on with harp and this is not just in terms of um, of normal. Uh, transverse communication, transverse wave communication, which is normal electromagnetic communication, but also in terms of scalar transition wave communication. We were able to see it, and we were able to see what was going on to a certain degree. We, it was so overwhelming. I mean, it had one of my colleagues in tears. He called me. He says, you got to fly to Oregon so you can see this. I sat down, and when I saw it, I was... I was astonished. I mean, it's too much to get into all of it in the context of this interview, but I was astonished. Just astonished, right. and and because it, it indicated a level of sophistication which hardly seemed human, uh, in addition to a level of sophistication which which made conspiracy theorists look like amateurs, um, look like not cases not because they were wrong but because they were so unsophisticated. This there's a level of sophistication that is that is so far beyond the comprehension of the general public because the general public has been systematically undereducated. And, you know, if you shine, I mean, I, I've never been successfully integrated into any government program for any period of time, even though I've been utilized and exploited um, on several occasions because I basically am aware of this stuff. Right. And my father was... Uh, verging on an awareness of, of, of what might become capable, they might become capable of. And of course, Andrew Puharich and people like that were some of the people who created the foundation and Nikola Tesla even, uh, so the, the exploitation of some of his technologies, which of course became HARP uh, with the ionospheric heater um, uh, following on his uh, tower technology, which in 1904 in a New York Times article on the front page of the New York Times, uh, Nikola Tesla talked about a global network of information transfer where energy, and electrical power literally, because he had patented the means to communicate electrical power without wires by that time. He could generate electrical power without fuel by that time, uh, without wind, without solar. He could generate electrical power. So he, can, he could inductively couple into the Earth's resonant magnetic domain field he could generate electrical power by doing so. In other words, harnessing the power of lightning, which is not just about ice particles bumping up against each other in clouds. Uh, people should refer to Hans Voland, electrodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we've known for a long time. There's certain people who don't seem to have ever learned that electrical power in clouds is not only created by the collision of ice particles. It is, it is created through inductive it's created through induction with the Earth's dynamic magnetic field. 
and these giant cumulonimbus strat stratocumulus clouds are actually giant electrical capacitors that inductively get charged and then discharge uh, between and what we call the ionospheric lithospheric uh, wave guide and um, so the, the lithosphere being the crust of the earth and um, and, and and so we we have to understand that why you know who is it that who is it that's doing this and, that's and the question the, isn't it and this and this is and this is one of the things see bucky Fuller was generally like to call himself apolitical until really quite late in his life, not, not long before he died. Um, he had been relatively apolitical in terms of his public stance. He was quite, with me and a couple of other people, he was quite vocal, but would always caution us and made us promise never to say, do not repeat what I've said about this, you know. But by the time... Uh, the early Reagan administration was rolling along. Um, he was very alarmed by um, the hijacking of the Republican Party by, you know, special interest groups, especially the pseudo-evangelical, I call it the pseudo-evangelical movement. Um, but um, I'm not saying there aren't genuine evangelicals out there. I'm just saying that he felt like it had been hijacked by specific kind of belief system agendas and okay. he was he was very 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 deeply concerned and actually gave a couple of really pretty intense interviews about it he also i also exposed him to an early manifestation of and reduction to practice of zero point technology uh, which was the which was basically the close path home polar generator and that story is famously present on the front page of our website, which is currently in revision because we've been attacked so much in recent months, right. in re recent weeks in particular, since the Thrive, um, since the Thrive uh, uh, trailer trailer. Ca trailer came out on the internet. Yeah, we should probably uh, talk about that. You were we, we, we you were approached. Well, I, think, I think I think I think we'll talk about that a little bit further down here. Okay, because we um, need to get from Bucky right yes, to yes. where you got involved. Well, and free energy. Well, I, you see, the thing was that I already knew that. I mean, I, I by that by the by sixty eight, I had already been exposed to z vacuum fluctuations. By sixteenth. Yeah, sure. And yeah, I mean, you know, I have to remember that I I would go and talk to people at the University of Chicago. I would I would go and talk to people. I I had an academic kind of human uh, resource in. Uh, people who had once lived in Park Forest and had moved on, but we still had connections with them. I would call these guys who were my father's former colleagues in the Central Intelligence Agency at Dietrich. I would call them and talk to them about stuff. And, um, uh, you know, and, and whether our phones are tapped at the time is unknown to me, even at this stage. But, I mean, you know, my phones are generally always tapped at this point. But the fact is that they, they would disclose certain things to me that they knew, and they would fall into place. And so, it, it basically, over time, and this is this is constant study. This is the, the problem with the way we run academia. It's kind of like somebody hands you the baton or the diploma at the end of a certain phase of it, and you, and people think that they've accomplished something. And and basically, the most that you can hope to accomplish is to have learned better how to learn. Right. And to learn and to learn better how to communicate what you have learned, and and in point of fact, with what we're witnessing right now, is um, is the dumbing down of the world, you know, and and, and what what Bucky eventually uh, was reacting to was um, his awareness that basically the global economy was being taken over by the global corporate hegemony, and that they were utilizing these incredibly sophisticated technologies f that now are that now look to me like you know like caveman stuff basically because I've been involved with computers since punch cards so I mean it's like what we can do now what I have sitting in front of me on this desk talking to you is um, uh, is an enormously sophisticated technology, and and these enormously sophisticated technologies are being exploited by a cadre of scientists and technicians who basically are the army, the techno army for the corporate hegemony, 
and 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 lack a moral compass too often. Not always. I, I, I've seen a lot of people burn out. I've seen a lot of people who talk to me about stuff over the years as I lecture around the world. They'll come forward and they'll say, can I talk to you? And I'll sit down and, and I always agree never to reveal their identity. I was going to say it's always off the record, isn't it? I always – well, it has to be because these guys – are telling me stuff that, and you know, and sometimes there's a couple, there's a, you know, there's certain kind of test criteria that I have over the years because, you know, I've also been approached by people who are intentionally trying to spread disinformation and people who are just nutcases as well. And, and so you have to, you have to learn a sense of verity. You have to learn a sense of whether or not somebody is actually communicating something that's true. And uh, in spite of all of our programming, somebody, the word UFO triggers this entire response that's programmed into everybody. Um, it's, it's so sophisticated. I mean, to consider the level of sophistication in terms of mind control sophistication that was required in Arizona in 1997 when the Phoenix, in March of 1997, when the Phoenix light incident happened. Um, right. consider, that, consider that literally hundreds of thousands of people saw a giant craft from Prescott, Arizona, all the way down through Nogales on the border with Mexico, and probably beyond that into Mexico. Uh, but we know for a fact that, that, that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people saw it. Um, we know that they had different sub subjective interpretations of it. Uh, some people recognized and were able to provide videotapes that indicated that the, that it was over a mile across, that it moved across the sky utterly silently at, at a very, very slow speed, which, of course, was aerodynamically impossible. It would have fallen out of the sky um, if it had been a conventional aircraft. Um, and yet, somehow or other, when Fife Symington lied about it under the pressure from the Air Force, he claims now, and other entities, um, when when and people were told that it was just flares being sent up from Goldwater Air Force Base, um, it's it's uh, it would have it would have made Bucky it was made Bucky's stomach turn, but it would have made Barry Goldwater, who was also a good friend of mine, it would have made his stomach turn because he was very very read in in terms of UFO phenomena, and uh, I had amazing conversations with him about UFO phenomena from a very young age, basically. He was a remarkable guy and very maligned by his own party, ultimately, because he was a, a real genuine American conservative. I mean, in the best sense of the word, not, not this weird perversion of it that's occurred. And it's dreadful what's occurred. I mean, these people call themselves a tea party. I mean, you know, give me a break. This is not sophisticated stuff, you know. Um, the, the people, the founders of the United States of America were very sophisticated people in a lot of ways, and they weren't. There was, it was wealthy, very educated people who started the American Revolution, not, not, not like from France where the intelligent people were getting decapitated. Right. Um, like but all, so, all men should be free, and we should be free to have slaves if we want to. Well, the, there, was, there was, of course, that holdover about slavery, but of course... Um, you know, and I'm not saying that was justified in any sense or whatsoever. I'm just saying that um, for the time, there was a level of sophistication that was demonstrated that was quite extraordinary. And, mm -hmm. um, and there's all kinds of, of ways I could branch off from that. Um, but I, I'm not going to go do a whole lecture about the United States and the revolution and all that stuff because we basically – we basically surrendered to the corporate hegemony. I mean, you know, talk about being under the uh, tyranny of a king. We're now under the tyranny of multinational corporations. Right. Um, uh, what Buck Bucky called the grunch of giants, the grand universal cash heist is what grunch means. Okay. Uh, it's, that's the acronym for grand universal cash heist. And, and basically trillions and trillions, as Catherine Austin, our dear, our dear friend Catherine Austin Fitz has pointed out very vocally since she was undersecretary of housing and urban development for the United States government under um, the Reagan administration, or under the Bush administration, excuse me. Um, and Jack Kemp was, of course, the head of it at that time, at that time uh, in terms of HUD, in terms of housing and urban development. But she discovered all this money being stolen in this cash heist. And, and we've just had this enormous global cash heist that's occurred through the central banks, 
not just in the United States, but globally. And keeps occurring. And, and, and you know, and, and demonstrated by the fact that, that Strauss-Kahn could, could brutally rape somebody, I mean, to the point where she was physically brutally injured. And 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 her and her credibility it was what comes into question instead of his, I mean, and because he was the former head of the IMF, which is of course it's, it's organized crime, um, as Catherine Fitz has pointed out, and as I absolutely have to say, we all need to be aware of. Everybody needs to be aware of these things, and people kind of get the, overwhelmed by what the the filtered bad news that's on TV, and, and it's and it's like. And it's kind of interesting because we'll notice things if if you I don't I don't have time or even at this point the instrumentation to be sitting around monitoring TV programs anymore. I have one instrument left, you know. They can, and basically right. people say, well, why haven't why hasn't the Institute for Advanced Studies published or not published but purchased more instrumentation? And it's because who would we be working for? You know, um, it's like. Or who we, would who would confiscate like, all of, all like, of your like tech? people? People ask me. They call me and they say, "Would you please call me if there's going to be an earthquake in California?" Because that's something that we. I was one of the people who, along with other colleagues, developed a, a means to forecast earthquakes. And we actually did this, and we demonstrated it over and over again. And the head of the Earthquake Center down in the, at that time, and in, in, uh, after we just forecast uh, another earthquake in Oregon in 1993. Um, this guy said, oh, well, it was just a chance, you know, happenstance situation. And, of course, we did it over and over and over again. And we'd been doing it since the Whittier quake in 1987. And actually, even before that, Elizabeth Rauscher and Bill Van Weiss and I forecast a few quakes, uh, starting out with a quake in Bakersfield in, I believe it was 1985. It was in 1985. I was like only a 4.5, but we forecast it. We, we, we were just, we, and we're still, we, this is something that has never been fully developed, you know. We spent a lot of money on it. We spent a lot of time, hundreds and I mean, thousands, literally, I spent in front of a signal analyzer, in front of a spectrum analyzer, uh, learning what the earth was saying, because no, one's, no one teaches this, you know. So you have to, you have to listen to the, what the earth is saying through your instrumentation, you know, like you have so to, so this listen. is equipment and instrumentation. That yeah. It's, it's okay. yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that has always been one of the underlying scientific premises of project earth has been that theory is okay, but, but, but data acquisition is where it's at. In other words, um, you can, you can think you live in a flat universe. Uh, you can think that the earth is the center of the universe in a geocentric universe, uh, like we did at one time, and then, then and everything orbits around us, and then Galileo takes his little telescope and shows the bishops of Rome um, that actually there's moons orbiting around Jupiter, which he, you can clearly see even in a primitive instrument. And, um, and, of course, then he is put under house arrest for heresy for the rest of his life after he was tried in a very brutal setting. And the you know, Catholic Church didn't apologize until 1984, um, so these things take time. The human species is sometimes not coming up to very high standards, you know. And there's, and ta- peaks, there's peaks and valleys in that. All he had to do was grab a Sumerian tablet, point at it, and say, look, sun in the middle, rest of the planet's around it. Huh? Oh, 6,000 yeah. years ago, they knew. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and then you had Aristophanes and Greece and, and et cetera. I mean, it wasn't like a new idea. But the fact of the matter is that as we acquire data, which Galileo was doing with his telescope, he was acquiring data. He was, he was acquiring data. He was, he was actually acquiring a new ontology. We were no longer to be bound by the Arist- Aristotelian geocentric uh, uh, you know, picture cosmology of ourselves, you know, where we have this picture of ourselves and the stars are in these crystalline spheres and, you know, the planets as well. You know, we, we started actually observing and acquiring data. Then we realized that the orbits of the planets couldn't even be circular. They had to be elliptical, you know, vis-a-vis Copernicus slash Kepler, you know, and Kepler, of course, was the one who really made that breakthrough. And, and on and on and on as scientific revolutions have occurred. This, these are changes in the consciousness of humanity. Every time this happens, there's a change in our, in our whole picture of ourselves. 
And and it's interesting, you know, you can go to a, a relatively sophisticated, what seemed to be sophisticated uh, country like Tibet spiritually. Of course, it, if you really study it, it was a place where there was constant warfare between the different sects of Buddhism. I mean, you know, Galupas fighting wars with with Kagyu's, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to even go off on that tangent, but I that's a whole other. I mean, I could also go on for, about, for a couple of weeks about that. But the fact is that their cosmology was very medieval and very primitive, actually, in many ways. And so now we have this unique opportunity, in, at least in this particular wave of human evolution. Uh, we, unfortunately, we live on an unstable planet. Uh, orbiting an unstable magnetic variable star. And that's our real situation in life. There's nothing consoling and Victorian about it. And, and the reason I bring that up at this moment is because we are, we are in a rapidly decaying situation in terms of the Earth's magnetic field, which we have exacerbated and accelerated um, by our own actions as a species. Because we are so poorly informed, it isn't that there are people who know these things there's just a handful of people is the is the problem right i'm not even saying that the people who are the so-called demagogues you know the, the the super super the 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 people who make bill gates wealth look laughable okay who right. make bill gates power look laughable i mean bill gates is a, a convenient uh bowsprit you know mm-hmm. um you know for the super for the super rich and yeah he goes around and and you know parades himself around but in point of fact there are people who are much 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 more powerful and much 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 wealthier i'm we're talking about just hands down and yet they don't but yet they do not demonstrate a modicum of intelligence that would be sufficient to create a sustainable world and in, and in fact their actions the actions that they have dictated through the false leaderships that we all suffer from and these false, this false tyranny that we all suffer from, as a result, we, we basically have ourselves manipulated into creating more and more fossil fuel effluents, more and more so-called greenhouse gases, which create a more and more insulative atmosphere, which attenuates the rate of dissipation into space of the heat that the solid Earth is actually generating as a dynamo that is inductively coupled to the sun and is actually a dynamo in and of itself as well. And, and, you know, one of the primary things we learned from the first homopolar generator experiments was that a fundamental law that we had all been taught in science, the law of induction, was fundamentally flawed. That no? the, the, How so? Because the law of induction is V cross B, which, which indicates that, that in order to generate a current, there has to be relative motion between a conductor and a magnetic field carrier, whichever one is moving, whether it's a magnetic field carrier or the, condu- or the conductor. So, um, in other words, in a whole polar generator, which is one of the simplest, if not the simplest form, uh, Michael Faraday discovered the first unipolar generator was, was before it was called a homopolar generator because that was just a magnet on one side of the disk. Um, in December of 1831, um, he did an experiment which showed clearly that if you rotated the disc in the magnetic field, the rotor disc in the magnetic field, this is a copper disc with a magnet hanging over it, that you could get that that primitive instrument voltmeter, to, the, the, the needle would get deflected a certain amount, okay? And there would be a certain number of so-called volts, which hadn't even been technically fully i mean you know this is the very this is the, time, this yeah. is the very beginning of things and um and then he cemented a cylindrical magnet to the axis of rotation of that copper disc and put a paper insulator in between the two and he the, and the needle was so still deflected so there was no relative motion is what i'm saying between the magnetic field carrier and the conductor which is a fundamental contradiction to the law of induction um, Lenz and Thering um, in the 1920s pointed out this contradiction. They also pointed out that that Albert Einstein, who was you know becoming rapidly a kind of demagogue at the time, um, that Albert Einstein precious little dealt with the issue of rotation. And so Lenz and Thering uh, came up with a, a very sophisticated idea of the dragging of inertial frames of reference with with rotating objects. 
using the unipolar and then the homopolar generator as an example. But this all gets buried, you see, and doesn't get taught to students who are, whose parents are paying enormous amounts of money or whose governments are paying enormous amounts of money and, and spending great deals of time and energy making sure they get a so-called education. This fundamental experiment was left out. It was actually, it was rediscovered, one of, the, one of the groups that autonomously rediscovered it was up in Canada, a group of um, high school instructors rediscovered the unipolar generator uh, and thought they had they thought they had invented a new kind of generator this is how thoroughly this has been kept out of the literature wow uh, and i was told actually i was attending a, um, and doing a presentation in england uh, uh, at a conference years ago and um, that i had a, i had just done a presentation and it was well received and i was i just sat down back in the audience um uh, and I was sitting between two guys who, one of whom, Fred Hoyle, was extremely influential in my life. Um, and uh, anyway, one of these two gentlemen uh, leaned over and he says, you know, you do know Adam. The, the next guy who was making a presentation was making a presentation about Faraday cages, which are structures you create to keep electromagnetic noise out of an experiment so you can see that the result is clean from those outside influences. Yes. Yeah. One of the primary reasons you would create such a structure, As, and he says, "You do know, Adam, that the first Faraday cage was not." He was whispering in my ear, "Was not to keep electromagnetic noise out." And I said, "Really?" And he says, "No, it was keep Michael Faraday in." He was quite crazy, you know. He was completely loony. <laughs> he said, "He said, he said, and they teach this in in the UK as a part of science history. I mean, this is integrated. It's in the textbooks that Michael Faraday had severe mercury poisoning. And when he and when he elaborated on the law of induction, it was as if he hadn't done his own experiment, which is actually printed in his first book um, called Experiments in Electricity and Magnetism. Oh, okay. Uh, it's actually printed there. It's this isn't like some hypothetical thing. It's and we we went to Stanford for our books back in the early research of our first generator. I would I was go down to Stanford quite a bit and uh, and and basically discovered that there was this actually they had a facsimile of his original handwritten diaries of that time and I of course made copies of that and brought it back up and much to the chagrin of one of my colleagues who said but that's impossible you know the all the equations say it's impossible you know and it's and it's right here I said right here right right here 1831 it's been there since 1831 man. You know, you know, it's like just be read <laughs> before all the rest of this garbage got laid on top of it, including Michael Faraday's own mercury poisoning and his his neuro disability that resulted. Um, this has been this has been discovered. So data acquisition again comes into play. This is data that that Michael Faraday acquired that got integrated into his early publications, but was carefully edited out as time went on, because the stuff that gets edited out is the stuff that is not convenient for the global hegemony, which which basically at, it was at one point a monarchical hegemony. You know, this is why all these monarchs interbred between countries. You know, okay. so they. Could, so they could create more and more integrated hegemonies, more and more integrated control over their populations. And of course, it was so the cultures and the economies were so stratified that eventually the quality of life that people were suffering was so diminished that things like the Bolshevik Revolution happened. And these two relatively benign, I mean, I know that there are Russians who would very definitely, did, you know, get furious with me for saying this, but um, relatively benign individuals like Tsar Nicholas uh, and Alexandra, um, these are relatively benign people from most accounts. Um, you know, were just trashed as as, and now it's like the the modicum of of wealth. I mean, that some people are enjoying. People who just have good jobs and are making a decent income will become the target of the unemployed and the homeless in the next revolution, um, because they will be seen as the enemy when they basically they're just trying to feed their families for the most part. And right. sometimes and sometimes they're complete corporate slugs too. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that they're choir children, you know, boys and girls, uh, who would, you know, I'm just saying that it isn't it ain't necessarily this so you know, it's like once you get up to the Bill Gates level, there's complicity there, at least. Right. Um and you know, and I think that's uh, and there are multiple, multiple layers beyond that. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh no, these guys are junior, junior 
players in a certain sense, extremely, but you know, it's a palliative. It's, it's kind of like I, I came up in the computer industry and got out of it at a certain point. But I mean, I met Edelstein, I met all these different people, Jobs, Gates, came to our booth at Comdex in 1983 and asked really good questions. Um, we had an integrated uh, interface, a front end to Unix that was quite sophisticated and could integrate word processing with, with spreadsheets. Nobody else in the world had anything like that at the time uh, that was on that level of sophistication. We got good write-ups in computer world and info world, stuff like that. But it was like I also discovered that the chairman of the board of the company was, a, was an intelligence agent who was assigned to me. He was my handler. And, um, of course, I wasn't ever supposed to, you know, I was told, don't you dare ever tell anybody this after he just confessed it to me. But it's like bullshit, you know. I mean, he said that if I didn't cooperate, my life would be, pardon my language, but um, it was that my life would be a living hell. And in Now, was actually, this when you were, because um, you built multiple units no this is just after this is just after the first one i met this particular individual at the first uh international conference on novel energy technologies at the university of toronto in 1981 and um and it was actually the first time i'd received a standing ovation to a presentation so i was i was you know i was young you know i was like (laughs) i was i was enthused i was i was just barely 30 and I was, um, you know, so I was greeted by a lot of people as I left the auditorium at the university. And um, and basically, this is one of the guys who approached me. And, so and, you were talking about computer technology or you were talking about uh, no, actually, free energy what, device? He, was, he approached me about my my speech, just like everybody else was. There was a, an old detective, retired detective from New York City who had come up to this conference uh, who told me that he knew Nikola Tesla had been murdered because he was it was his first case that he worked on as a young detective after he'd just gotten his gold shield, you know, and um, and he was quite a character and, and left an indelible memory in my nervous system, which has survived many traumas, but okay. uh, but the fact is that uh, you know, this is just another one of those infiltrations into my life of which there have been many, actually, and uh, because I, there's some of us, there's a few of us who've been loose cannons. Bruce De Palma was a loose cannon. He was a guy who was Egerton's assistant at MIT in terms of Schlieren photography, which is, you know, stroboscopic, high-frequency high stroboscopic photography where you can see things. In those days, it was very sophisticated. Um, and then Bruce started doing some experiments with what he called the end machine, which was basically a homopolar generator, which he didn't know about. He hadn't been ever properly, you know, he really thought that this was it. He had discovered this. He really believed it sincerely. He wasn't a liar. He believed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was very, he was a very, very bright man, Bruce. And was that, that was based on your there was, earlier there was, technology? No, no, it was, no. It, Bruce, Bruce made his first home pole generator before we ever made a generator. No, he, he made okay. his first, he made his first really functional home polar generator at Sunburst Farms, which was a kind of a, SRF Self Realization Fellowship spinoff with a guy named Acharya Bernard who was actually a very good engineer, and um, and and his first the the pictures of his first or not just the pictures but when you actually see his first generator, it's it's kind of like an 1800s 1880s 1870s piece of antique furniture is what it looks like. It's it's beautiful. It's it's beautiful. Okay. The big big old knife switch, you know, nothing sophisticated or state of the art about it. It was very primitive, and used carbon brushes for Christ's sakes, you know. Um, it was a very primitive device, and he extrapolated a lot on his results, kind of freely extrapolated on his results in a way that I found to be disconcerting and unscientific. But there was enough there between Faraday who I was studying, and I tried to bring to Bruce, and, and Rolf Schifranke at NASA, who had written this book called Ether Technology, which I had been handed by a friend one day, um, who was one of Werner von Braun's cohorts from Nazi Germany, who had been brought over with all those other people in the Brill uh, and the other, the other program. Yeah, Project Paperclip. Yeah, and he, they were brought over, and you know they were given tattoos and told that they were, had been Jews, which was very difficult for some of them. Um, to pretend to have been Jews and to have been in Buchenwald or Auschwitz or something, but they were given cover stories and 
And I'm not saying that everybody who was a scientist working for the United States government who had a tattoo and a, and a story like that was making a cover story, but there were a bunch of them. There was a, there were, you know, the guy who invented the synchronous motor. I could go through a whole list of people who this applies to, who we know about. Um, my father was very disconcerted, of course, having been a highly decorated officer in the 8th Air Force. He was very disconcerted to find himself working with these people who were torturing people who were doing chemical experiments, biochemical experiments on people and doing mm-hmm. biological warfare on inmates in these concentration camps, including the poisoning of the inmates with fluoride so that they wouldn't reproduce, so that they wouldn't have sexual drives, so that they would have fewer problems with them. They'd be more do- docile. Right. And, and the University of Ontario, I believe, actually has a very good report online about about fluoride poisoning and about how it causes depression because it interferes with the calcium metabolism. So you have, you have these things, you have, you have, you have the United States government and the Canadian government to a certain degree. And what, I don't even know if the Canadian government allows fluoridation anywhere any, at this point. Oh but, yeah. It's but I think, I think, through Canada. I, think, I think it's pretty ubiquitous there. Yeah, I, everywhere. I, know, I know that it's Canton by Canton in Switzerland. I was very surprised to find, like, in the Svitsa Duch Canton, there's fluoridation, for example. Um, and, and basically, we're telling everybody to get the fluoride out of your damn water because it's all about concentration camp logic here. It isn't about your tooth decay because, actually, the amounts of fluoride that are being put in the water can, can cause embrittlement. And, they, and there's all kinds of dentists and dental papers that were written back in the 50s that, that you know, were... You know, chlorine had been added to keep the bacteriological counts down, et cetera. But and 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 then there was this weird chemistry that's, that was actually causing a lot of tooth decay. Um, and so they had to do something to try to to mend that. And so they, I'm not saying that dentists don't believe that this is true. If you, if you if you need to take a a, a trace amount of fluoride. Uh, to in- increase the strength of your enamel, there's other ways to do it. Let's put it that way. But you, if you want to do that, to take a very, very, very tiny amount. Right. But the fact is, the fact is, getting back to this, this is like all about control. Okay, so this is this is everybody I know um, who has been involved in this science. Everybody, I mean, that has really maintained any kind of consciousness. And this is not a Republican Democrat thing. I'm talking about Barry Goldwater. I'm talking about um William F. Buckley. I'm talking about people who were very major influences in my life um as I was growing and developing. I'm talking about John Lilly. I'm talking about um all kinds of uh, Lee Sanella, Robert Monroe, on and on and on and on and on realizing how all of these technologies that could be creating a a planet of universal abundance and helping us deal with and remediate and ameliorate the inherent instabilities in our solar planetary system, which we really have serious um, problems with, without us doing anything. There are serious instabilities that need to be ameliorated, that need to be remediated as much as possible. And we actually have the power to do that if we implement these technologies in the right way. It's really kind of late in the game right now. I have to say, I don't want to be a purveyor of false hope on the one hand. And on the other hand, we could emerge like that Star Trek First Contact movie where you see basically the post-apocalyptic population of the planet Earth and somebody coming up with a warp engine and then a whole new earth evolving so a whole new paradigm and this, and this was and this was very intentional on uh roddenberry's part um and i worked with gene and i did some ghost writing for that series for the next generation i did ghost writing on several occasions actually and i had a very very wonderful ongoing um relationship friendship with him and so we, very intentionally you show people um uh, an image of a of a post apocalyptic population that emerges from that kind of catastrophe economic obviously they're living in poverty they're living in an economic catastrophe they're surviving in these kind of bergs you know and um and suddenly this guy comes up with a warp engine and it totally revolutionizes everything well we we believe that that you know just the adaptation of nikola tesla's technologies and those that have been developed since then 
could create a politic of universal abundance, even in the even faced with the catastrophe, both environmentally, ecologically, geophysically, we, and, and atmospherically, we are going to face horrible consequences for what we've done. We have greatly imbalanced this planet, which is already imbalanced to start out with. Again, one of our primary mantric keys in, in Project Earth has always been when you have an unstable planet to start out with, orbiting an unstable star, you don't want to add irritation to that system. You don't want to add more instability to that system. You don't want to set off underground nuclear tests in Nevada yesterday. You know, you don't want to set off underground nuclear tests in China. You don't want to set off nuclear tests in Pakistan and, and India. You know, you, you, want to, you want to avoid creating those kind of spikes in the electromagnetic resonance system which is in the process of rapidly decaying and breaking down. We know the Earth's magnetic field is breaking down. I mean, to the point where National Geographic, God bless them, has put on a couple of very, very clearly communicated programs about the fact that our magnetosphere is breaking down. It's been breached uh, on more than one occasion. The magnetosphere is our primary shield against solar radiation. Right. And, and the ionosphere is our secondary buffer. The ionospheric, magnetospheric, system is is directly and always in real time coupled with the lithospheric system through the ionospheric lithospheric waveguide and then it's also directly coupled all the way down into the core and 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 so this is not like you can break the system into pieces you have to understand how it works as a whole comprehensively and, that, and you have to understand it comprehensively there's no way a, a guy who's focused on one part of this can understand it comprehensively and 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 it's unfortunate. It's, it's not that there's no way that he that he or she could understand it. It's just that that's not generally the path that they're taken on. And I I find you know I just talked to at the Aspen Institute last summer. I talked to two really really very very bright geophysicists from USGS who are accompanying the head of the USGS, who is someone who I would say maybe doesn't demonstrate the same kind of intelligence. Um, I would have to say that. Um, but they were quite intelligent and quite receptive to what I was saying about earthquake forecasting. We've been doing this for a long time. But the fact of the matter is when you understand, when you watch this stuff, as I have and a handful of us, there's only a few of us that have had the privilege of having these years of sitting at these decades, watching, literally watching the heartbeat of the earth and watching how solar flares in, impacted, watching how anthropogenic technologies impacted. Um, you know, watching these things in real time and understanding that, oh, you know, there's a lot of stress on this fault and they just set off a nuclear test. And so this fault at Loma Prieta, for example, in 1989, which had a lot of stress on it, you know, south of San Francisco, um, suddenly releases, you know, after a nuclear test. Right. Did the nuclear test cause the quake? No. The quake would have happened anyway. The nuclear test may have accelerated the rate at which it occurred. In other words, it changed the timeline. And the same thing, the same thing is true of HARP. The same thing is true of so many, many things that we're doing, adding more greenhouse gases unnecessarily for 100 years, since the beginning of the fossil fuel revolution, it, 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 the, the whole fossil fuel revolution. And perhaps course, they, in other previous civilizations. Well, I mean, whatever, waves yeah. of humanity. Well, yes, of course. And and the thing is, again, we're talking about, you know, we have fossil remains over 200,000 years old of hominids that have the same degree of brain development or greater than we do 200,000 years ago. So what, it begs the question, if we can do this much damage in 5,000 years or 6,000 years since we've emerged from the last destructive cycle, when you know when the earth you know some some disruption happens to the spin moment of the earth and giant tsunamis occur and we find flash frozen mastodons and mammoths in siberia okay with with honeysuckle seeds still in their mouths yeah. this this obviously was a giant tsunami that went very far inland and then it froze which means that the, that at the same time that happened the polar orientation the spin axis of the earth changed as well and and so you can try to ignore these things all you want to, 
And, and it's interesting to me over time, people who call this stuff pseudoscience, uh, frequently the ones who end up, eat, uh, almost always end up eating crow, not always, because there is a lot of pseudoscience. There's a lot of people saying that people are intentionally causing, like Haiti was caused by harp and, and, you know, the Japanese quake was caused by harp. And, you know, it's like, it's ignoring what we've done to the basic system. We were, I was telling people in, from Japan, in Japan, in 1988, that there are geophysicists who were saying that they only needed to build the walls at Fukushima and along the coast of Japan up there in, in northeast Honshu, um, like 10 meters, you know, that, that, that was too short. And they said, no, 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 that's perfect for a 7.5 to an 8-point quake. And I said, nonsense. In the first place, you're going to have quakes that are much bigger than that because the Earth okay. is hot. Because we, as we slowed down the rate at which the Earth is able to dissipate heat into space through the atmosphere by making the atmosphere more and more insulating, okay, as we slow down the rate at which this heat can be expressed in space, it is backed up into the solid Earth. Everybody talks about the greenhouse effect like it's just the atmosphere, man. It's like the whole planet, okay? The whole planet has to be able to dissipate heat just like you and I have to be able to dissipate our caloric body heat constantly through our epithelium, through our whole you know, muscular skeletal system. We have to be able to dissipate heat or else we would overheat ourselves, okay? We, the earth has to be able to dissipate this heat that it is generating constantly it has to be able to dissipate that heat into space, and we are we are attenuating the rate at which that happens. And so, therefore, magma genesis occurs beneath the beneath the crust of the Earth. Melting occurs, and these giant rock glaciers we call the tectonic plates start to move more frequently, more violently. More and more magma is expressed through the oceanic rifts, and as that as that magma, which is from the melting of the material right below the crust of the earth, which is very thin in the ocean. Sometimes it's from that, and other times it's also from hot spots coming directly up from the mantle. But whatever the source, as the earth heats up um, internally, then basically more magma is being expressed through these rifts, and you get lateral hydrostatic pressure, which accelerates the rate at which the Pacific Plate, for example, is rammed under Honshu or the, the rate at which the Pacific Plate is rammed under um, off the Juan de Fuca Straits, right. off of the coast of Washington State, off the coast of British Columbia. Um, we really need to understand these things. And, you know, I remember when I was working with the Clinton administration, I was working with a very, very wonderful, brilliant guy named Captain Michael Egan, who uh, was actually a commander when I met him. And, um, and he was the head of strategic planning for the U.S. Coast Guard. And and he was he he actually we sat on the phone for weeks and they recorded everything we said and transcribed it and it became part of the template for reinventing American science under the first Clinton administration. Okay. Um, but of course, it ran into these these roadblocks because basically, who were the people who were still doing science in the Bush administration by the time George Bush left, after eight years of Reagan and then George Bush? You had people who had learned to tow the, the a lot of the people who had learned to tow the line of political correctness under those administrations were the people who had survived at NOAA, at NASA, at NCAR, etc. There had been great purges that had happened in American science that allowed for disasters like the uh, Challenger disaster, which which some of us raised hell about for several for a few days before the actual launch occurred because the Morton Thiokol manual says clearly do not launch, do not ignite these rockets, these solid booster rockets that are the two side rockets uh, that, that uh, do not ignite these rockets if they have been subject to, to, to temperatures under 32 degrees Fahrenheit because basically Congress had only allotted a certain amount of of uh, funding and the fuel had was far too hydrous there was far too much water content and therefore it, it could freeze i mean if we had spent it was yes okay it was 18 percent more 17 percent more it was quite a bit more on the fuel end of things then then that couldn't have happened and also we there's another thing we had we we're supposed to have monolithic seamless cylinders of 
for the rockets. Instead, we had uh, sections that were joined with O-rings in between. And, of course, when this thing froze and thawed, it would crack, and then there's a danger of something we call sideburn. And hardly anybody in, in NASA even knows about this. I mean, my, my mentor at NASA was a guy named Henry Landsman. Right. And, and Hank and it was, was like this incredibly powerful force there in some ways. But he couldn't get it stopped. I couldn't get it stopped. Nobody could get this damn launch stopped. And I lost a, a friend of mine, Ron McNair, who was going to be doing some deep infrared photography from up there, from the space shuttle, from that platform um, of the Cascadia range, because uh, we were trying to get some measurements of how how much the entire chain of the Cascadia Range might be heating up. That was one of the things he was looking at. It's not the only thing he was looking at, but it's one of the things. And, um, and you know, it was wonderful because I knew Richard Underwood, I, I who I had recently become um, just in, not in awe of exactly, but I developed a great deal of respect when I was speaking at this conference with him at the University of Massachusetts in 1985. Um, and he exposed the audience, this packed auditorium full of people with absolutely unbelievably stunning indications of the, the enormous destruction of planet Earth that was going on underneath our, our um, in our unconsciousness, let's put it that way. Right. I mean, the disappearance of Lake Chad, a lake the size of Lake Erie. Um, and it was, it was, as if this was almost a casual event, I mean, you have this beautiful turquoise blue lake sitting in the desert. Yes, it was sitting in the desert. Yes, it was already shrinking. I mean, all those arguments are valid and, and, and need to be brought up. But, but the deforestation of Africa at that time and the undermining of the hydrologic cycle in Africa by that deforestation um, greatly exacerbated and accelerated this process, and of course, the expansion of the of the Sahara Desert to the south, as well, and it, which continues to accelerate. By the way, just as the Gobi Desert is expanding and accelerating, I mean, you know, Beijing they have to have a whole contingent of of the you know, Chinese army that that pu is pushing sand back on the edges of Beijing because the desert's expanding there so rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, we d we just don't. We don't seem to, we're talking monkeys who don't have the intelligence, it seems, in terms of the people who are actually implementing policy, not in terms of everybody, but in terms of the people who are actually implementing policy, creating and implementing policy. Um, we don't have the intelligence to realize that when you destroy equatorial rainforests, when you just, in Africa and in South America, you undermine a global hydrologic cycle. You undermine gro global hydrology, not just, it's not, you can't isolate it. And it's not in a test tube. It's not in some kind of isolated situation. I'm sorry. That's all we have time for this week. Join us next week when we'll be continuing our conversation with Adam Trombley on BBS Radio 2 at 7.55 p.m. Pacific, 10.55 p.m. Eastern. Remember to check out the Spectrum website at www.spectrumradionetwork.com and Adam Trombley's website at www.projectearth.com. Dot com. Talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye.